Oh, oh. Into the nose. Into the nose. Okay. They need to be going down into the cavity, right? So when you put them in, you need to make sure that they're they're kind of hooked in going down, right? Do y'all get that? And when you get them, you can kind of look at it and see how they're supposed to go, okay? And when you put it in your patient's nares, remember this is going to be in front. I see people wrapping it around people's heads all the time. That's not how it goes, okay? Because it can get stuck. It's hard for them to take it off, all that good stuff, okay? And if it's a confused patient, they'll choke themselves because they like to try to take them off, okay? If this is down in the front, then it's going to work better, okay? I don't know how many people have touched this thing, so I'm not going to put it on my face, but <laughs> put the prongs in the nares, put these around the ears, and then you tighten this, not too tight, but you want it to where it will not just fall off, okay? There's a little roller clamp, okay? Y'all got that? All right, I do have a flow meter. Okay. Flow meter, you will see this, and I hate that we don't have any in our lab, but you will see this on the wall at the head of your bed. Okay, there's air, there's suction, and then there's oxygen. Oxygen is green. Okay, so you're going to have this, and you'll have to get in your facility to see how you actually put it in. Usually you have to push it into the wall and turn it so that it hooks in there with this, okay? But you'll see this hanging out of the wall. And this is how you regulate the oxygen. You have to have what we call a Christmas tree on there. They're not always green, sometimes they're clear. But you'll screw it on, make sure it's all the way on there, and then you take your tubing the end of your tubing and you push it on okay and then you regulate it to whichever setting you need however many liters you need okay so when I pass this around make sure that y'all can do that you can hook it up you know play with this it won't actually go up and down because we don't have oxygen running through it but look at your numbers be able to tell okay if they say four liters where do I want my ball to be and you want it to be the ball needs to be even with the line Okay, you're centered with the line. All right, so I'm going to pass this around, and then we have, all right, simple face mask, same, same principle. Sometimes you want to use these if maybe your client is a mouth breather, maybe they're sleeping, whatever and they can't really get the oxygen they need through the cannula because they're not breathing through their nose. Um, so you put this around the client's face, okay? This goes in the back this time. And then you wanna pinch the metal part at the top to make sure that it fits around the face, okay? And then you're gonna take the other end and you're gonna hook it again to the Christmas tree, okay? And then you're gonna regulate your flow over here. All right. All right. Now we have a venturi mask and a non rebreather. Do y'all know what you use either of these for? Venturi is for nebulizer treatments and the non rebreather is for seriousness. Okay, so what y'all really need to know <laughs> higher levels of oxygen. Okay, higher FiO2s. You want the percentage of oxygen to be elevated. Okay, it says on here nasal cannula. How high can you go? Four to six. Okay, one to six. And then if you go above four, you always want to use humidification. Okay. All right. So venturi mask, and you can look when I send this around. Look at the diagram, and it kind of shows you how to put it together. Okay, but just like anything else that we do, you're going to have to, when you go to your facilities, you have to know what they have because everything, everywhere has something different, okay? Usually the Venturi masks that we see, they have a smaller little adapter here and they, they have one of these <coughs> on there, but you turn it to whatever flow you need. This one, you have to change out this depending on the concentration, okay? you got to change the adapter. All right, so... Look at these. These have different 
concentrations. It actually tells you on there the percentage of oxygen and how many liters per minute to use with the Venturi mask. So make sure you're looking at that and you just kind of can figure out how to hook it up. Because wherever you go, you're going to have to look at the instructions and ask somebody, right? You're going to learn your facility. All right. And then your non-rebreather. What's important about the non-rebreather? The bag's fully expanded. Your bag has to be expanded. Okay. So non-rebreather. We want a really high concentration of oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody that's really in respiratory distress, doesn't have any contraindications, you want to use the non-rebreather. Of course, remember, you always have to have an order for oxygen. Now, you're going to have, you know, treat oxygen just like a medication because some people, if you put oxygen on them, it could kill them, okay, for different reasons. Y'all will learn more in oxygenation, but you don't want to put oxygen just on anybody. Now, generally, you'll have standing orders, things like that in your facility. You know, you know where your physician's orders are and things like that. Depending on why the patient's admitted, they may have orders saying, okay, if they're O2 sat is 92 or below, you can put them on two liters, okay, something like that. But you have to make sure a lot of these, when you, when you hook it up, it'll automatically fill. Some of them you have to press the little valve to fill it up, okay. It just depends on what type you have. Um, but make sure this bag is filled, that it's open before you put it on the patient, okay. And then, again, you hook this to your Christmas tree on your flow meter, which is going to be on your wall. Okay? Y'all have, is that simple enough? Y'all got any questions about that? Okay, think about, okay, when you have the nasal cannula, remember, you don't want it catching on fire, right? So what are you going to tell the patient? No smoking. They could blow up the whole hospital, right? If they're at home, you know, you're really going to have to educate them of what could happen. You know, a lot of times it helps to show visuals and things like that if you're able. Um, I had a hospice patient that was in her home and I was scared to go in there and sit with her to do my visit because she had oxygen on and a tank and she was smoking like a chimney all the time, no matter what you told her. So, all right, I'm going to pass these around separately. So down the middle. And over here. Just kind of look at these a little bit and I'll pass the flow meter around too so you can just look at it and what it's going to look like. Just make sure, just like on an um, insulin syringe, you got to really look at what, where your level is, okay, which you'll learn about. Nas make sure you're looking at how your prongs go, okay. <laughs> a lot of them are more curved than what these are, so you can actually see that it goes down into the nares. Okay. All right, again, when you're looking at um, practical things with your oxygen therapy, any kind of therapy that you put on a patient, if you're putting something on their face, what do you need to look for? Skin breakdown. Make sure that, you know, if they're getting indentions, you may need to use something that, uh, you know, on the cannula, we have these little things that are like cushions. Um, on the mask, you may need to just loosen it a little bit. You don't want to break the seal around the mask, but you can adjust it or get a bigger mask because you don't want that. You'll see on these patients, especially if they're in ICU, they've been kind of laying around or, you know, they lay on their side like this, they'll get those indentions in their face. So you have to kind of monitor that, make sure you, you know, pull that mask back, uh, loosen it up every once in a while, okay? And just make sure you're assessing for that. Mm. All right, so where's my clicker? All right, there's one on the desk in there, on behind your purse. Okay, look to think about your patient's comfort, y'all. Okay, the mask, if you're putting that mask and you have that elastic band going around their head, just think about things like pulling their hair, how uncomfortable it is, make sure it's not too tight. Okay, just make sure you're thinking about those things. 
Um, always check your orders and then monitor your blood gases if needed. Make sure you're looking at, especially if they have COPD or something like that, you want to look at what's going on with their lab values before you just stick oxygen on them. Okay, if you have somebody that has um, shortness of breath or anything like that, what's the first thing you're going to do? Okay. And you're going to assess them, right? You're going to look at what is their pulse ox. You know, listen to their lung sounds, things like that. Yeah, setting them up does what? Expands their lungs, okay? All right. So with wound care, um, we're not going to go over all the different types of dressings that you could possibly ever put on a patient, but there are a few important things that you need to know. You are going to have... The important, sorry, the important things about dressings, okay? You're going to have an order for your dressing, especially if your client has gone to surgery and come back. They're going to be very particular about what kind of dressing they want for that client. Um, think about, have you already started looking at, well, obviously, your return demos today, your wound care video, how to do a wet to dry dressing. Make sure, remember in level one you did just a dry sterile dressing? Okay, look at whatever it is that they want you to do for that particular client. It's not all going to be the same. You know, some of them may want uh, special things that you clean it with, like baking solution. Some of them may want you to just clean it with some sterile water and saline. It depends on what they order, so you've got to follow those orders. Um, how often you're going to change the dressing. A lot of times they'll write that you change it, you know, Q shift and PRN. That means if it's soil, what are you going to do? Change it, okay? Um, a lot of times when they go to surgery, they don't want you to do the dressing change the first time. Usually the provider will come in and they'll actually do that first dressing change so that they can look at the incision and things like that. Um, Irrigating a wound basically is like, you know, you can do it with a flush. Have y'all started practicing IVs yet? No. Okay, you can have little pre-filled syringes of normal saline, they're like 10 cc, and you can irrigate a wound with that, with sterile dress, sterile 4 by 4s and things like that. Or you can have a large bottle of solution, okay? Either way, Irrigating is basically just washing it out, okay? All right, I'm going to pass around my surgical Sally. Oh, Lord. <laughs> now, y'all, on your own, at your table, as a group, you can kind of do this together. Okay. A couple of y'all. And don't... Don't try to pull out all the staples, just everybody pull out maybe one or two, okay, just to see how to use it. Um, let me show you this first. All right, and this is, y'all usually these are in a sterile kit. I didn't have a sterile kit. Okay, all right. All right, so the skin staple remover kit, basically it's just the staple remover, but it's sterile because you don't want to just use one on everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have your suture removal kit, okay? So I'm going to pass this around on one side. There are a few things on here that have sutures. Just clip one, try to pull it out, get the feeling for what you're supposed to do with this, and then I'll pass Surgical Sally around with a couple of these um, all right, so what you're going to do when you when you get a chance to look at this, there is um, a thing that has two prongs and a, just a straight one. You want to put the two prongs underneath the staple and push it down because it pushes the staple up. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, so I'm going to start this over here. Y'all can start doing a little suture. Do I have alcohol? Do I have alcohol? 
When I get done going over all this, and I'll just kind of let y'all have a free for all. There y'all go.
you know, they're checking them constantly. They're right there by them. But when they bring them to you, they may say, you know, every 30 minutes for two hours and then every hour for so many hours and things like that. But use your best judgment. Are they at high risk? Mm -hmm. You might need to check them more often. All right. So just remember that picture. All right. So y'all haven't started on IV stuff yet, practicing or anything? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, y'all will get to IV stuff and um, actually doing IVs. I did not bring any IV fluids or anything because I was kind of hoping y'all had already seen that, but you will. Uh, the biggest thing that y'all need to look at as far as this goes for IV is making sure that, you know, remember everything is sterile that is inside of that path that's going to your patient. It's going into your patient's vein, into their body. So everything that's inside of there needs to stay sterile. So that means if you touch it with your hands, then you know, you're know you introducing bacteria to that pore, okay, where you hook it up and all that good stuff, okay? Um, redness and swelling. Now, if you have an IV that is infusing fluids, like say you have something going at 100 an hour, okay? and you got it going in to that patient, then what could happen? It could infiltrate. It can infiltrate. And that happens because maybe the needle, the cannula that goes in there, remember we don't have needles that stay in the arm anymore like they used to. It's just a little plastic cannula. Patients don't realize that, so you have to educate them. But the cannula that's in there can be pulled back some, mm -hmm. and then it's no longer in the vein. It's just, you know, in the skin, under the tissues, okay? So you have to really watch for, if you feel like that arm's starting to get a little bit bigger, mm -hmm. then you need to be assessing it very often. Uh, if the patient's complaining that it's hurting, then you probably need to stop it if it's infusing. Um, certain things that you might give, like antibiotics, especially vancomycin, you know, that's going to be something. If they're really complaining about it hurting, you don't have to change sites because they really need the medicine, but that's very, very caustic to their veins, so you have to rotate your sites often. Usually in the facilities, you have to change IVs now every 72 hours. You know, some, some may not really care how long you have them in there, but most of them, like I know Memorial, when it's a clinical there, you had to actually check and look at when it was put in, and it's got to be changed within 72 hours. Um, so watch for that wherever you go. You, why do you think they do that? Infection. Infection. Uh, it's it's kind of a place that can harbor bacteria under that mm -hmm. dressing, so you got to watch out for it. Uh, where all do you think you can put an IV? A lot of places. Okay, Kelsey, tell us. Uh, I mean, like an IV IV or like... Arms. Just an IV. Arms. Peripheral okay. IV. We're talking about peripheral IV right now. Okay, here. so Sorry. what nurses can do is pretty much like from the neck, like below the neck and down, nurses can put in, only doctors can put in nets. Um, unless you're a peach nurse and you can put in a head. But <laughs> Okay, we're talking med surge. Okay, so the AC brachial, which is like the bend of your arm, your hand, your wrist, um, forearms, then upper arm. You usually have to use ultrasound, but it's still like going into a vein, so I guess you would still say it's peripheral. Feet, only if you're non-diabetic with an order. Um, haven't seen any in the legs, but... I'm sure you can put one there because there's some massive injuries in there. Yeah, usually, <laughs> usually the feet are a very last resort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've never seen one in a leg because usually they do the feet. But remember, what is? Where's your foot? Like down. way Hello. down there, Disgusting. away from your heart, right? So if you're wanting to what? get something, it's going to be harder for it to get through your system. Usually, if you're at that point, you're like, hey, just throw out a central line, please. Yes. Yeah, usually so. Um, okay, so there are a lot of places you can put it. Usually you're going to see it in the AC. If they have fluids infusing, that's terrible. That's a bad idea. Don't put it there unless you absolutely have to. Um, and in the forearms. Okay, now central lines are a little bit different. 
Okay, essential lines are generally put in by the provider, but they will put them in at the bedside, and it's a sterile procedure. Okay, where are they going to go? I have it on here, here, here. Okay. Okay, so you might see a subclavian. You might see either side, right? Mm -hmm. or left, EJ or IJ, we don't ever really care if it's EJ or IJ because it it's the same thing. <laughs> We're having to assess the same thing, right? Yeah. Okay, um, and then for moral, y'all in level one physical assessment are always so scared to actually palpate the femoral pulses, but y'all got to get over that. I know you don't want to do it on your friends, but when you go to clinical, you better be doing it. Mm -hmm. You better be looking at your patient, assessing them, if they have a central line in their femoral, y'all, that's nasty. Mm -hmm. It's a huge risk for infection. So you've got to be looking at that. You've got to be assessing it. You've got to be changing the dressing, all that. Okay. Usually you have to change those dressings every three to seven days in most facilities for the femoral, mm -hmm. for any central line. Um, pick one I brought, which. I didn't bring the central line chest this year because they, they said they go over that in level three a lot, so y'all don't really have to know a whole lot about it. Just know safety, changing the dressing, assessing it, things like that. Um, and remember, the central line, it's central, so you really have to watch out for not putting the air bubble in there because it's gonna go straight to the heart, okay? Um, this is a pick line. Okay, so you're going to see this like this. This is what's inside. We're not worried about that. But you can be specially certified as an RN to put in pick lines, but you have to go through, you know, the whole class and certification and all that. Um, and a lot of places won't even let you take it out unless you're certified. Okay. But you'll see usually they have a tegaderm, some dressing over here, over this part, because that's going right into the skin, right? So mm -hmm. you always want it to be covered. Um, when you change this dressing, because remember, every three to seven days, you're gonna have to change the dressing so it doesn't get nasty. When you change the dressing, it's a sterile procedure, mm -hmm. okay? So, and y'all, y'all aren't gonna do this central line dressing changes until level three, but I just kinda wanted y'all to be able to look at it. Um, and I think, I'm pretty sure y'all probably have a video if you want to go watch it. But the thing is, you want to keep this part sterile. Mm -hmm. Okay. All this down here, this is where you're giving the meds. And, you know, some places let you draw the labs out of it at yeah. certain times and things like that. But that's where you're going to do all that. So that's not sterile. But remember your IV techniques. Mm -hmm. You don't want to touch it. You got to clean it before you access it. All that good stuff. Okay. All right, so y'all can look at this, pass that around. So since we haven't like practiced or done IVs yet, is that gonna be on the test coming up? That is a part of this content. So um, look at, I will tell y'all, because I know y'all worried about what's gonna be on the test and blah, blah, blah. So let me tell y'all a few things about your objectives. All right, so looking at your objectives, there are a few things on your objectives that you are not going to have, okay? Chest tubes is one of them. Chest tubes is level three. Y'all will get chest tubes in depth and oxygenation in level three. So you will not have test questions or anything on chest tubes, okay? Um, what else did he say? EKG. If you get something on EKGs, it's going to be about technique and, you know, what you do with the EKG. It's not going to be reading any rhythms or any of that. Okay? That's in cardiac. Y'all get plenty of that. That's not going to be part of skills. Fluid and electrolytes. We're not going to ask you about what fluid to give or anything like that. 
the only questions you're going to have related to skills are what you do as a nurse, you know, maybe what you need to watch, what you need to assess, things like that. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So we're not going to ask you about, you know, giving this IV fluid versus this IV fluid or any of that type of stuff. Okay? Everything else, yeah, pretty much. All right. So let's see. All right. Uh, venipuncture, so y'all are going to be testing off on that as well this semester. Um, so you'll get into that, but know what you need to know to actually do the procedure. What are you going to do first? Verify orders. Okay. You're always going to verify your orders, do all those steps. But when you're actually doing the skill, what's important? Sterility. Okay. You're assessing where you're going to draw the blood from, right? You have to look at, you know, have they had a procedure where you can't do it in that extremity, things like that. What else? Sterility. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Is venipuncture really sterile? No, no. But, no. but you use aseptic, aseptic technique, aseptic. right? As much as possible, make sure you wear gloves. I don't care how many people you see not wearing gloves, drawing blood. Make sure you wear gloves. Um, make sure you're clean in the skin. Look at, I put order, I meant like, look at what's ordered, what labs. Um, make sure if you don't know what kind of tube you're supposed to be using, call the lab and ask them and make sure you know how much blood that they actually need because you may be trying to get some blood out of a turnip you may only be able to get a tiny little amount but it may be enough so make sure you're checking with the lab you know do you need a purple top a blue top a green top whatever make sure you ask before you put that patient through drawing that blood and then it's not the right one or it's not enough okay that's some of the biggest things y'all need to understand about being a puncture that y'all aren't going to be tested off on. Um, but make sure you realize anytime you're introducing something into a patient, whether it's through the skin, whatever, you introduce germs, bacteria, okay? So watch out for that. Clean the skin very well. What's, what do we generally clean the skin with? Okay. Alcohol. Alcohol or swabs, but on your thing you put on there was some C word that I have no idea what it is. Okay. Chlorhexidine is a very good thing to use. They use that for surgical scrub. So, you know, before you send a patient off to surgery, you may have to bathe them with chlorhexidine. So that's the best thing that you can use. But, you know, we use alcohol. We use, you know, the iodine that comes in the little packs, things like that. Make sure you're assessing what the client is allergic to, of course but make sure you clean the skin with whatever you have available at your facility. Um, a lot of times you have those chlorhexidine swabs, you'll have them in wipes just like you do alcohol swabs. Mm -hmm. A lot of facilities carry that stuff, so just keep that in mind that that's a better Get that option. one first. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so this just kind of shows you some of the um, central lines you may see and uh, Infusaport. We're not going to go into much depth, like I said, y'all are going to do that next semester, but this is what you might see, um, subclavian. You have sometimes double lumens, triple lumens, it depends on the patient's condition. You may have a patient with several of these. They may have one in every place that they can have one because they have all these different things going in. Um, make sure you know what mixes and what doesn't because sometimes you know there are drugs that you can't give in the same line at all you have to still start a peripheral to do another drug or something like that um, or if they have several others you may have to get another line put in um pick line basically the same thing you're going to see it um just kind of out like that that's a securement device that they have on there most of the times those come in kits, but if you work somewhere that doesn't have a kit, you might just have to tape it good, put a tegaderm over it, um, and then when you're doing your dressing change, you know, they may put that on in surgery, and you may not have another one to replace it with, so you got to kind of deal with what you have in your facility. Um, if you see this, it's called a port. Um, they actually implant that surgically. That's something a lot of people 
a lot of the ones that I've seen that have it are people that have sickle cell disease because they're constantly in the facilities getting, you know, medications, fluids, things like that. Um, maybe if they're on chemo to give some chemo drugs, things like that, they may be, they may have a port. So you have to assess, you have to ask them, you know, what their history is and do they have any kind of lines or ports. Um, this also, remember, it's right up under the skin. So when you access it, they have this big, needle. thick, straight needle that you just stick straight into the middle of it. But you have to make sure you secure it and you have to make sure you clean it. It usually doesn't hurt the patient. They usually can't really feel it because it's just that one little layer of skin and they're used to it a lot of times. But you just watch out that you're securing it and you're cleaning it good. If you remember, I don't expect you to know everything about all this right now, but if you go into your facility and you're not sure how to do it or what to access it with or any of that, just make sure you're always asking questions, okay? One of the biggest things about skills is if you don't know or aren't sure, don't let somebody send you in there to do it by yourself because that puts you at risk for having issues and it puts your client at risk too. Um, what's the difference between, or is there a difference between the uh, central venous catheter and then like the catheter you use for dialysis? Oh yeah, that's that's different. It's different. Okay. Yeah, it is different. And usually you'll have if you have somebody, they you will have somebody that maybe has a pick and a dialysis shunt. They don't want you using that dialysis shunt for anything except for dialysis. But you, you should know that with your patient. Okay. You know, you should know your patient's on dialysis and make sure you know where their shunt is. And y'all will go into that. I think y'all don't have dialysis till level four. Yeah, I should okay. have But yeah, it's it's different. You can't put meds yeah. through that. And all, I mean, the dialysis people can, but you cannot. Yeah. So if they have a dialysis shunt, don't touch it. All right, any other questions about this? Y'all treat these just like um, your peripheral lines. Clean them every time you access it. Scrub the hub, remember. Um, don't put air into them, all that good stuff. You still want to go slow. If you're using like a central line, you want to make sure that you're using 10 cc syringes to give anything because it's less pressure. And you want to, you know, give medication. If you have to push medications and things, make sure you're giving them slowly. Um, you can do like otherwise. You can do anything you would do with a peripheral line, like hanging IV antibiotics or hanging fluids. You know, you can do those at the normal rates and things like that. This is a picture just to kind of show y'all if y'all haven't seen somebody that's, you know, had an IV to infiltrate. Can y'all tell the difference? Okay. It may, and this is how it kind of starts out. You may just go in there and be like, ooh, that just looks a little bit bigger than the other one. Looks a little puffy. You can kind of feel, it feels a little soggy. It feels strange. You feel the fluid under the skin, basically. Um, but it can get a lot worse than that if you're not assessing often and making sure that you're checking on your patient. Because a lot of them, they don't know to say anything. They don't realize. And especially if it's up higher, like maybe you have an AC and a cubicle of IV, then, you know, they may not be as readily able to see that it's infiltrating. And it may not hurt. They may not really feel anything. So you have to assess. Um, another thing about the pick line, if you have a pick line, one way that you can tell, because it, it's going this way, right, mm -hmm. their, their upper arms will be swollen, so you have to kind of measure if there's a difference. Uh, usually when they put them, on, put them in, they measure the arm circumference and they measure the length and all that good stuff, so you know, you know what it's supposed to be when they take it out. They document all that on your chart. device for me to bring in here so I thought that I would um, show y'all a video Ooh, if I can get it to work. <laughs> What's the short of this? Does it get control and then click on there or something?
on knee replacement surgery yesterday. She is recovering well. Part of her recovery includes the use of a continual passive motion machine, otherwise called a CPM. The CPM machine cradles the leg and moves the knee through flexion and extension without the assistance of the patient. This helps to maintain good motion after surgery. Jean will use the machine several times a day. Each day, she will increase the amount of flexion to reach a goal of 120 degrees. Okay, so I just want to see y'all to see what that looks like because if you have a post-surgical patient, you may actually have to set that up and all that good stuff. Um, one of the things that you need to know about that is make sure that you have it. Okay, make sure that you have it set up to where their knee is bending appropriately. Mm -hmm. Okay, like it's got to be in. When it bends, you want their knee to be where the machine bends, okay? And you'll get, when you go, especially if you work on a surgical unit or you have a lot of post-surgical patients, you'll get really familiar with it. But just as a basis, just know, you know, that's kind of like performing range of motion without you having to stand there and do it. And it goes really slow. Um, they have to be in it for a certain amount of time and things like that. But it basically just, you know, makes it to where when they need to get up, they're not going to be as stiff. You know? mm -hmm. It helps with their mobility and all that. Um, so looking at when they're doing that, you have to watch their skin integrity. Mm -hmm. Okay, They usually have pads on them, different types, you know, they're usually soft, but just make sure you're looking and assessing every shift for making sure they're not getting any breakdown. Uh, and then pain, you know, if it hurts, it's probably going to hurt a little bit, but you make sure you medicate them and then, you know, follow the provider's orders. You know, what, how often do they have to do it and things like that. They may say, as long as it's not excruciating pain, they got to do it because, you know, in the long run, it's going to be better for them. All right, who knows what these are? Um, compression devices. Okay, SCDs, SCD, right? Mm -hmm. Sequential compression devices. All right, and we did, we do, in level one, we do a lot of uh, TED hose, right? You mm -hmm. learn about TED hose, probably put them on in the pool and things like that, but mm -hmm. we don't talk about SCDs. And I, this is really heavy. But I kind of wanted to show y'all, not just this part, you know, this is the part, and you'll look out on the yes, these, these are old, fine, these probably nasty, mm -hmm. but. Um, these go obviously on the patient's leg, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the part that, you know, you'll probably not see until you go, so I don't want you to be totally clueless about how to put these up. Generally, they have, and some of them are, some of them look different from this. They may be different colors and all that good stuff, different shapes. But basically, this hangs on the foot of the bed, okay? Just goes over that footboard, and it sits there. And you gotta plug it into the wall. It works by electricity, so you gotta plug it in. <laughs> and then you gotta hook the things up to the patient's legs. Okay? It's that simple. But when you go in there the first time, you're gonna be like, how do I do this? I don't know how to do this. So, all right. So this is really heavy, but I'm gonna pass it around so y'all can. Please don't. I already know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kind of cumbersome. Or I'll sit it here and y'all can look at it. Alright. And like I said, they're all going to be different, so you know, you got to find the button to turn it on and just know how it works. <laughs> Alright, so what's the big deal about SCDs? Helps with blood circulation in the legs. Okay, so it helps prevent clots, right? Yeah. By circulating that blood, it's pumping. Okay. So you got to make sure they're not too tight. Okay. You got to be able to put two fingers up underneath them usually. Um, they do have different sizes. Make sure you have the appropriate size for your patient. And then, can you put on Ted hose with this? Mm -hmm. Yes. A lot of times you'll get a patient from surgery, they'll have they 10 hose, hose on, on and, and they'll have this already hooked up. You just have to plug it into the wall, make sure it's on the end of their bed. Um, as you'll see, they can be kind of cumbersome. 
So if you have a client that's going to be getting up out of bed a lot, you need to teach them, either teach them how to take them off or unhook them, or you're going to have to, you know, make sure they call you. Now, if they're on bed rest, you're just going to have to tell them, okay, you got to lay here with these on. A lot of times if they're really ambulatory, they may say they can have them off during the day, mm -hmm. you know, if they're getting up a lot, but at night they definitely have to have them on. But post-surgical patients, it's really, really important that you do the test and SCBs so, you know, they don't get those blood clots forming. All right, any questions about that? Make sure you're checking skin integrity. Obviously, that's one of the biggest things. Make sure they're not too tight. Okay, if the patient complains that they actually hurt, you know, they shouldn't hurt. They should kind of be like a massage. Mm -hmm. So, if the patient complains that they really hurt, then you need to assess and figure out what's going on. All right, NG tubes. Y'all know all about NG tubes, right? Mm -hmm. oh. No. Yeah. Aren't y'all doing NG tubes today? Oh, yeah. I was kind of going to skip over this because I figured y'all are on news. Now, let's go through that in detail. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. All right. So, oh, y'all got a testimony. Yeah. Y'all have right now. <laughs> okay. All right, so NG tube. So before you put one in, what's important for you to do? Lubricate. Lubricate it, yes. All right. Measure it, assess it. Nasal pain. So y'all remember how to assess that, right? Okay. And then check in for their gag reflex. Um, measure, how do you measure the length? Yeah. Put it from the nose, nose over the ear, ear and down the ear. Because we did talk about it last semester. All right. So, all right. So, y'all know what it looks like. Y'all have one in your kit. If you want to pull it out, oh, y'all don't have your kit. We don't have kits yet, no. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> I didn't bring one because I figured y'all be Okay. So remember, it's got to go from the tip of your nose around your ear and down to your xiphoid process, okay? And that's where you're gonna mark, okay? So that you know how far this should be hanging out here, okay? Does that make sense? What, what you mark is gonna end up here, mm -hmm. all right? So, lubricate, you will see it sometimes when you're putting it in, it'll be wrapped up in the back of their mouth. So you can have them open their mouth so you can see that it's not back there, okay? Um, you know, you can have them swollen while you're putting it down. Some people like that, some people don't because they're gagging too much and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, make sure, like simple things that you may not think about, make sure you're clean it. Like they're going to have lubricant all over their nose and things like that afterwards. Make sure you're cleaning them up, making sure they're comfortable as possible. Um, what else? So what was your way with Belle? <laughs> Like, you talking about this test stop? This yeah, this test stop. Like, if it came this out of their mouth. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. They're so, we're going to do this all together. Y'all oh. will okay. okay. be fine. Y'all don't even know what y'all are doing. I'm not even level two, and I know what y'all are doing. Come on. Yes. Yeah. It's the opposite. All right, Kelsey has a question or comment. I've seen like three different ways that people do it. Like they don't, they don't like do anything to the tip besides lubricate it. Do you? I've seen people also like cold water or hot water. Well, like one like I guess to make it more pliable to go down, and the other one makes it harder, make it easier to go down. Usually, we kind of take the tip and bend it. Mm -hmm. That way it'll kind of go down, it'll go the direction you want it to yeah. go, but I've never put it in water. That's just... <laughs> kind of make it where it ain't right. so stiff, I guess. Yeah, I guess it could melt it a little bit. Okay, so when you open their mouth, it just makes it a little more flexible. Two, you've gone the wrong way. You have to pull it back out and try again. Okay, if it's, pull it back out. If it's coiling up in their mouth. Back, right? Go back into the... You can no, see it, you just want it to come into the mouth. So yeah. it needs to go down Remember, first. Remember, tilt the head forward. Okay. Y'all just, y'all haven't asked as much questions about anything else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, tilt head forward. It's going down. 
when, when do I lift so the do, head? You do if it like this to get in the nose, right? You made me do it in ATI last night. I lifted the head. <laughs> one of the questions. What that's what ATI is. Oh. <laughs> it made us do the order. It made us right. do the order. That's yeah. put, move it all in order. After I'm done, watch your video. <laughs> Right. <laughs> All right. So, and remember what what you what can you do with NG two? <coughs> Feet. <You can. laughs> okay, you have to do a chest X-ray. Really? What else? Do suction. What do you do? Why do you oh. put them in? Suction. Yeah. Okay. I have I have a suction canister. So, remember how I said there will be suction on your wall. Okay. All right. So. On your headboard, you'll have suction as well as oxygen and air. So, you have to actually look at, and you probably will have one of these like hanging on your wall. Um, generally, we keep them in the rooms. But look at your actual canister that you have. It tells you what to do, okay? So, and you have to get tubing, it's separate. It comes in a separate pack, okay? They may have it at the bedside for you. But you hook the tubing up to the vacuum on here and you hook it up to the suction on the wall okay and then you have to hook the patient's tubing up to where it says patient <laughs> y'all never seen this before right no okay. so it's simple it really is I hanging on the wall in the hospital but don't make it more complicated than what it is <laughs> look at it if you're not sure if i can do it y'all can do it okay all right so i'm gonna set this on this side just kind of look at it. So and this is the same the um it doesn't you know, do anything else. But remember, NG tubes are not always for suctioning. So, you know, if you're giving something in an NG tube, it's kind of a lot like giving it through a tube. Some of yeah. I know some of y'all have done that, but some of y'all haven't. So, you got to actually, you know, do it by gravity. Don't be pushing it in there. Things like that. Alright. Okay. Anything else I need to say about that? Right? You can give meds through an NG tube, just like you do a pig, crush them up. You're supposed to do it how? Crush one, dissolve it, give it, flush, all that good stuff. Okay, one by one. How many milliliters was it? Like 15 or 30? I think it says 30. But a lot of times um, the provider will write an order because they want them to have a certain amount of fluid per day. So they'll say, you know, flush this much with meds. Okay. So you kind of divide that or flush it at the end, whichever way you want to do it. They do NG tubes with babies that I mean, yeah, if they need nutrition, they can feed them that way. Yeah. And you um, you can do um, bolus feedings, remember, where you have like a can of food, like Ensure or something like that that's made to go enterally and get your syringe. <coughs> So you have to have your irrigation tray. Okay, so you got your syringe and you got your thing for water here. So basically, you have to actually take this out. You know, when you hook it up to your patient, to that tube, whether it's a PEG tube, NG tube, whatever, and you just pour in there after you check placement and all that make sure it's in the right spot it's not in the lungs mm -hmm. you pour the meds in there or the feeding in there and let it go by gravity you never want to push it unless you know you can give it a little a little nudge to kind of help it go in but you don't just push it in there okay all right y'all got that all right i should have brought it in Mm. So how how are you gonna check placement generally? X-ray. Okay, X-ray, but it was oscillator. Okay, that's not in your book. No oscillating. I know we did that. That's what they do in a lot of places, but technically you're supposed to use what? Aspirate, right? You're supposed to check the pH of the aspirate. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you hook, you hook this syringe up to the end of your NG tube and you pull it back. Well, they say put air first. And then you pull back. You don't have to get that much. And then you put it on the pH strip and 
it should be what less than four. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so you're that talking tells about you, like that tells you it's in the gut. Oh, yeah. like yeah. still, like every other time after. Is that what you're saying? Like yeah. you check. They say it. before you feed or put anything or in one, you're supposed yeah. to check it every, every time. Oh well, yeah, but I meant. Oh, so, okay. but, you meant but initial a person. lot of facilities that I've been to don't have pH yeah. strips, so you have to do it the old-fashioned way and listen, make sure it's in the gut. Is it bubbling? So, yeah, you hear it kind of gurgle, bubble. Yes. So these things are terrifying. Um, do I'm confused on like. Is there a way you can mess up, or does it normally just go into the stomach? I mean, I know you need to check the placement with it being in the As long as you put it far life. enough and you don't go in the trachea. You don't know that it goes. Usually it goes where it needs to go. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's not, I mean, I'm sure it happens every once in a while, but you have something in there that stops stuff from going into your trachea, right? So. Usually, usually it doesn't happen, but, you know. I mean, won't there be, like, telltale signs if it does happen? Like, will a patient, like, react in a certain way? Like, well, I mean, you can, yeah. I mean, they're, like, you're coughing. You're in my throat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll be coughing. Okay. All right, yes. All right, listen. when you first place it and then aspirating for pH is like every time before you put something in it to make sure it hasn't been pulled out. And that's also what that mark is for that you're you're measuring the length. You know that mark, if it's way out here, then you know it's not down in the gut where it's supposed to be. Okay. <laughs> I mean if you if it it is possible for it to get pulled out, even though you tape it really good it's still possible for it to come up. So obviously at that point you're going to be like, no, this ain't right. You're going to have to put a new one in. Okay. Alright, so. Alright, um, for time's sake, I'm not going to go over really. If This uh, PowerPoint is in your modules in Canvas, so if you want to click, go to this link, it is, or if you just want to go to your Evolve course, and look at the video for bladder irrigation. You know, you can do that. Um, basically, bladder irrigation, remember the bladder is sterile. Okay, so whatever you do, you have to make sure, just like with the IV, if it's going in that bladder, you need to keep that line sterile as possible. So if you have to, if it's continuous and it's hooked up, you do bladder irrigation through a catheter, but it's got to be a special catheter, okay? It's got a valve where you can actually instill stuff and then it comes out. Um, but if you're instilling something in there, you need to do it as aseptically as possible and the line, the stuff inside needs to stay sterile. So you're not touching all over with your hands, you know, all the tubing that's being connected back together and all that stuff, okay? So go on there and watch that video. I mean, I, as a nurse, have only done bladder irrigation maybe a handful of times. But the biggest thing you got to remember is keeping their bladder sterile as possible. Okay. Um, colostomies. What's important about colostomies? Have any of y'all dealt with colostomies yet? Yeah. Like the biggest thing was like. Listen. Was the skin around it? from the, like, this, I had this one patient, his, I don't even know why, he, he should have just not even had a bag, it was so, like, bad. Mm -hmm. It was so pink, and then I would imagine, like, the benzo spray just, like, burns it even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you're going to have, this is what you're going to see with a colostomy. You know, remember, depending on where they put it, depends on, you know, it's going to tell you whether it's, you know, softer or it's more formed, but it's usually still pretty soft. Um, but this is what you're going to see with your colostomy. They may have a different type of bag, but it's pretty much going to look the same. You're going to be able to see what's in there, if anything's in there. Uh, you need to change it often because it will leak, it will pop off, you know, if it gets too much pressure in there. Even if it's just from air, from gas, okay, coming out. Um, you're going to have, it's going to be attached to the skin. So, you need to make sure you're looking for that skin integrity. Uh, around that stoma, you know, you may have some feces, so 
depending on your facility policy, usually they change them maybe every few days. Mm -hmm. I really don't remember because it just depends on. Usually, you don't. It doesn't stay on that long, mm -hmm. so you're changing it anyway. But you're emptying the bag continuously. Like if it gets halfway full, you need to be emptying it. Okay. So you're always looking at it and assessing it, but actually taking the whole bag off and all that, usually you don't do that very often. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, they do get really loose and they come off, they pop off, you know, the edges start coming up, so you have to change it you know, every few days anyway. But you're looking at that skin integrity. Um, the actual stoma itself is supposed to be pink and moist. So if someone isn't at the hospital, if they're yeah, just the same as we would do in the hospital. You know, they, they empty it out when they need to empty it out, and then when it's time to take it off and change it, they take it off, clean, and put a new one on. You know, they have creams you can put, they have powders you can put to help them stick better, things like that. Paste, stoma paste. Paste. If they obviously, if they have a lot of hair, they may have to clip it around there so it sticks better but yeah they they just get used to basically getting their own nurse just like somebody with a, a super pubic catheter or anything like that they cat themselves at home just stick it in there and empty it out and then they do what they have to do i mean um when you some of these come with the uh, the things are already attached the wafers some of them you actually have to cut out the hole so just make sure, if you have to cut out the hole for a stoma, that you're making sure it's large enough to not occlude that stoma. Because mm -hmm. that stoma can die, and remember, that's part of their gut that you're actually seeing protruding out of their skin. So make sure, you know, it's supposed to stay pink and moist. Make sure it's got good circulation. Um, I think that's it about colostomies. Just make sure it's clean, make sure you know, you're emptying it and all that good stuff. Yeah, you'll have a patient like that. And when you do, I want you to think of it. Okay. It never fails. Right. It's always a stinging patient as well. Yeah. Never so, like I said, we're not going into reading uh, rhythms or any of that. Y'all get that in cardiac. But the biggest thing is when you're putting on those pads, putting them on correctly, and y'all, it tells you on the box generally because you have the leads and it's hooked up to a box that has batteries in it and transmits to the telemetry room or whatever, and then you have the leads hooked to the patient, and that's all you gotta do, okay? The little sticky pads, I didn't bring any of those either. They have the little sticky pads that go on there. What do you think you have to do with those? Okay, make sure they stick for one. So how are you gonna make sure they stick? <laughs> if they have a lot of hair, for one, that's a conduction issue too, but also to help them stick, you got to make sure you clip them, make sure they're dry and clean, no lotions, you know, all that good stuff, okay? Um, you want to make sure that they stay hooked up. That's a big issue when you're dealing with patients that are on telemetry, especially if they're the type that you know, they're ambulatory, they want to go to the cafeteria, they want to go outside and smoke, all that. You have to look at your facility policy, but a lot of times they don't want them going off that floor because then they won't be able to pick up their signal. And they'll say, we don't know if they dropped dead of a heart attack. We didn't know it. Get into the or whatever. Um, so just make sure you're, you're looking at that. Um, all the leads are connected. And there's five, let me think of how, how it goes. So. I always was taught smoke over fire and then snow over grass mm -hmm. and then the browns in the middle always because the leads are always black and red and white and green. So, but like I said, it's usually on your box. It tells you where to put them. Um, what else about that? Anything else important that y'all read about? Because I know y'all read about nursing skills already. <laughs> No, it's not, they shouldn't feel anything, I mean, except for the pad sticking. And that's that's one thing I was getting at earlier, is make sure, you know, you're gonna be rotating those sites. Make sure you're taking off the old ones. I hate when I go in, used to go in, and see like telemetry pads all over that they're not hooked up to anymore. Because you'll have 
they're just everywhere. Mm -hmm. So take the old ones off, put new ones on at a different site, not over the same place they've had them for days because they're going to get broken down, okay? Um, just be careful when you're pulling them off because, you know, a lot of times they are really sticky. So. Um, okay, so LPN roll. There are a few things that the LPN cannot do. Um, they can't push IV meds, so whatever it is, pain meds, anything, they can't push it. They can run IV antibiotics, things like that, if they're certified, but they can't push meds. Um, they can't do it, they can't. <clears throat> do meds through central lines or anything like that. Um, they're pretty limited on what they can do. But they can actually hang antibiotics, fluids, if they're certified, IV certified. Which a lot of places now are going to where they, they do that while they're in school so that when they get out of school they don't have to go pay for certification. So it's getting to where they want all LPNs to have IV certification through their school. That way they don't have to worry about getting it later. Remember when you're thinking about infusion therapy, it's a med. Even if it's just a fluid, it's still considered a med. So remember still your six rights. Do y'all remember y'all six rights? Mm -hmm. okay. So you're looking at the patient, you're looking at you know their identifiers, you're looking at their orders, comparing it to the MAR, you know, all that good stuff. Um, so don't forget about that foundational information. Check in their allergies. Make sure they're not allergic or, you know, if it's penicillins, it's not just, you know, that one drug. It's other things they could be allergic to. Um, and then, like I said, fluid electrolytes, we're not going to ask you a particular question about that on this test, but just remember that is going to be important in IV therapy. If your client has CHF, are you going to run that fluid at 200 mils an hour? No. No, obviously not. Um, you know, be able to tell if your client's dehydrated, you know, and then look at your client. Where are you going to put that IV? Things like that. You have to assess what's going on. Okay. All right. I want everybody to make sure that you've gotten to see all of our, our fun things. Are they still going around? Mm -hmm. Surgical Sally? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I got... Um, some of the stuff up here, y'all want to look at this before y'all leave. I didn't talk about incentive spirometry, but y'all know what this is, right? Yeah. Do y'all know how to tell a client to use it? What do they do? You got sit up. Okay, sit up. What's the purpose? Expand the lungs. Expand the lungs. They want their lungs to be open. All right, so they need to take slow, deep breaths, right? Even if it hurts. If they need to splint a wound or something, they can splint it, but they need to be expanding those lungs. That's what this is for. So when you breathe in and breathe out? They breathe in, and that's what makes this go up. And you can set it to where, you know, they have a goal, or you can set it to where this is where you were last time, so maybe you want to go above that. But as they breathe in, this is going to go up, and it's going to show where they're at, and they want to get higher and higher. Okay. So right after surgery, they might only be able to go a little bit, but they need to be getting better. Okay, so just kind of teach them what that is for, uh, preventing pneumonia, things like that. All right, I think I talked about everything. Maybe I didn't talk about drains, but I just kind of wanted y'all to see this. Okay. All right, wound drains, uh, this is called a hemovac, this is called a JP drain or Jackson Pratt drain, just in case y'all hear when y'all go to clinical or when you start nursing. Um, you will get to, to know how to use these, but basically this one, you're going to see it kind of crinkled up, and then it's going to fill up with fluid you know, from their wounds. So it's usually going to be bloody at first and then get more and more clear. Um, so you're going to have to open it up and empty it into something that you can measure in, like a graduated cylinder or something like that. Okay, so this is considered output. You need to make sure you're keeping up with that. Okay. And then your JP drain as well. Y'all, the first time I took one of these out was out of my mother. She told her doctor, oh, my daughter's a nurse, she can do it. And I was like... I got to this point and I said, oh my God, it's not coming out. You're going to have to go back to your doctor. No, just pull it out. I was 
crap. So I started pulling and lo and behold, look how thick that is. Mm -hmm. So it freaked me out. Don't let it freak you out in front of a patient. <laughs> it's kind of, you're going to feel some resistance. You're going to have to just pull it out. Okay. All right. But what you're going to see, this is going to be inside the patient. And then you have this end that's kind of hanging out. Sometimes you have multiple ones, just depending on what they had. She had a lot of plastic surgery done. Anyway. I was thinking the same. Um, so, yeah. all right. So you kind of have to squeeze this. And then it's going to be pretty flat. Well, this one must have a hole in it. Anyway, it's going to stay pretty flat until it starts filling up with stuff. Like, again, bloody. You know, at first you'll have a lot of output, and then you should get less and less, you know, days after surgery. And then they'll tell you to discontinue it. So, but this is what you're going to see hanging. So just know what it is. It's a JP Jackson Pratt. Jackson Pratt. And you just empty it into something you can measure because they're going to want to know how much came out of that. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. I know this was quick. It was a lot of information in a short amount of time. Not covered as much as I wanted to, but I promise y'all got everything you need if you take that ATI test that uh, I did. Um, read the biggest thing. The question may not exactly relate to what we're doing, but maybe something in the rationale might tell you something important. So make sure you're going through. When you go through that test, it's only 50 questions. This was supposed to be three hours, so it needs to be at least an hour activity. So make sure you're using that time wisely. I'm sorry if y'all thought y'all had to have it done by today, but you don't. So go back in and take it again, looking at the rationales and reading it. Okay? All right, if y'all have any questions, please email me.